benefit film screening on Saturday, March 16th at 7.30 p.m. This rare collection of powerful documentaries showcases the artistic contributions and legacies of renowned queer women of color musicians like Avacha, Carolyn Brandy, Afia Walking Tree, Amber Field, and Cuban hip-hop trio Las Crudas, a Q&A panel with the musicians and Quack Map filmmakers, Zamaya Martinez, Avascue Levias, Sean Neely, Amber Field, Alejandro Cruz will follow the screening held at the Brava Theater Center, 2781 24th Street, San Francisco. Admission is sliding scale 15 to 50. This is a benefit for Quack Map. The event is wheelchair accessible. For more information, call 415-752-0868. And you're listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is a minute past 1 p.m. Up next, Tara Verde. the Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Hello, I'm Michelle Chan, and you're tuned to KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, or KFCF in Fresno. Welcome to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental radio show. Well, in honor of International Women's Day, we today will be talking with two women based right here in the Bay Area who are deeply involved in helping women around the globe, including some of the poorest countries in the world, find solutions to the problems they face every day, from fetching water to feeding their families, all while building their own security and their own power. With us, we have Gemma Bulos, who is the director of the Global Women's Water Initiative and the recipient of numerous awards. And we also have Margaret Youngs, project coordinator for Sub-Saharan Africa at the Global Fund for Women. Welcome to the show, Gemma and Margaret. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Well, let's start with you, Gemma. You actually started the Global Women's Water Initiative, but before that, you really got involved in the water sector through a previous organization you started called A Single Drop, which worked in the Philippines. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Prior to uh, uh, co-founding Global Women's Water Initiative with Melinda Kramer at Women's Earth Alliance and Jan Hartso at Crabgrass, um, A Single Drop uh, was partnered with these two organizations, and the work that we did in the Philippines was creating community-based water service organizations that actually could provide their own water and sanitation services um, and generate income through it. Uh, what was exciting was to see communities come together, identify their own needs, be able to design their own systems, be able to implement them as well as manage them and find ways to to uh, to maintain it through through income and uh, and tariffs. Right, and really, I mean the sort of water challenges that everyday people, including and especially women, face in the Philippines um, and probably around the world is not just in terms of access to water, although we always often think about, you know, women having to walk so, so many kilometers, for example, to get their water. It's really actually a range of other things, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, water affects our health. It, it affects our livelihoods. It affects education. It affects nearly every uh, everything that that provides opportunity for us to to excel and to thrive uh, in terms of how water affects health you know if you have contaminated water or bad hygiene or don't have access to sanitation you're at high risk of disease in fact one of the highest causes of, of disease is water related and um, in fact over half the hospital beds in, on any given day in the world are occupied by people with water related disease well, yeah, and it's often times women who actually are the caregivers mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely. They're the ones who have to take care of the family. So when they fall ill, who has to stay home and take care of them? So they lose opportunity for livelihood. And then uh, they have to spend money on clinics or on medicines to, to make sure that they, the people you know their family members get well so there's all these uh, the and then you know if they're children they'll lose uh they won't be able to go to school if they're husbands they won't be able to go to work so it just it just is this snowball effect about contaminated water and lack of access to it right to clean water yeah and one of the interesting things actually about your organization is that when you partner with um 
with organizations, and maybe sometimes they're women's organizations, maybe they're not, but you, you partner with these women leaders, they don't necessarily come from a water background or, or a wash sector, the water and sanitation sector. I mean, tell us about how, you know, how you, 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 find common cause with some of these incredible leaders. Definitely. Well, uh, Global Women's Water Initiative is actually housed under Women's Earth Alliance, and we are all about partnership. And what we are looking at when we partner with these women, oftentimes these these organizations that come to us, many of them actually through Global Fund for Women, um, are organizations that have other organizational mission statements or organ, you know organizational goals for example we have a team that does ex commercial uh, trains ex commercial sex workers uh, you know vocational skills for alternative livelihoods we have people working in environment uh, maternal health but every single one of those organizations recognize that in order for them to reach their organizational goals and to be as effective as they can they need to address the water issues in their communities. So these women have identified that these wash is in wash. When I say wash, I mean a water sanitation and hygiene. They need to include that program into the fold of their organizational mission and move forward with it as a complementary, if not foundational uh, program in their organization. Right. And when you talk about um, building community level or community managed um local water systems. So what, what does that really entail? When we, uh, because oftentimes the women that we are working with have never picked up a shovel before, we have to focus on simple technologies that they can build, things that uh, require no background in construction, no background in engineering. And so the technologies that we teach them aren't necessarily community-based. They're not uh, community-serving. They're actually more around self-supply. So the kind of technologies that they build are things like rainwater harvesting systems, with uh, storage tanks, uh, filters that can be built out of local materials, uh, toilets that can also be built out of local materials. So we're focusing on those self-supply. And one of the reasons why we're focusing on self-supply, if you have a community system, uh, if it breaks down, then the entire community is affected by it. And so if no one knows how to fix it or if there's there's no available parts or there's no uh, resources to actually finance the, the repair of it, then the entire community is left to its own devices. Whereas if you have a self-supply and it's it's at the home or it's shared by a couple of households, then people will take care of it because they've invested in it. And you better bet if something fails, they're going to figure out a way to fix it. Right. And so you have women going out and let me get this straight and building latrines and you know water tanks and things like that. I mean, this is, I, it, it's kind of extraordinary. And how, how, how is it you received and how do they do you know what's exciting is that uh the women will go you know because there's there's always going to be that that fear of uh you know challenging gender stereotypes um uh, but the women that we work with are already proven leaders in the community as you know they're they're coming from organizations like global fund for women we know they've been vetted we know that they already have this uh the capacity to implement projects in their communities and what's exciting about it is that these women are finding that they are not only constructing these things they're getting hired to do a man's job and they're hiring men to help them so <laughs> it's, just, it's just flipping everything on its ear and it's so exciting to see because these women you know never thought they could do this before and here they they are after one training, after one year of uh, support from Global Women's Water Initiative to be able to not only provide their own family with clean water, but the entire community. Well, I mean, flipping gender stereotypes and gendered work on its ear, you know, it has to be pretty, I mean, it has to push the edge, actually, in a lot of cases. I mean, don't they get some pushback? I, I would imagine. You know, we haven't seen any. And if they, if we have, if they have had any, they've been able to, I think one of the reasons why it's a little easier easier for communities to sort of absorb or accept that women are doing this is because it's such a need. You know, there's there's a great demand for clean water and sanitation in the communities that these women work in. So anybody coming in with solutions have got to be well received. Otherwise, you're going to wait for your government or you're going to wait for another outside source to come in and do it. And you you could be waiting forever. Yeah. Je uh, Margaret Young from the Global Fund for Women. Mm -hmm. um, let's bring you into the conversation. <laughs> you you um, actually work with a lot of um, women's um, organizations, actually, in the agriculture sector. Yeah. But you've got to see lots of parallels. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, water is essential to the agricultural process. And a lot of the groups that we're working with um, rely on rain and other terms like whale, whale water. Uh, 
So you see time and again that they're very worried about water access, about climate change, um, you know, things that are, you know, difficult to tackle on their own. And so they look to their women's groups to really find new solutions, uh, get the support they need to implement them. Some are large scale, like putting up stones on their land so that uh, water can be better absorbed and the the soil can kind of develop and be enriched. Um, And those are things that it kind of takes a community. And for our project on agriculture, we're actually working in three countries, Burkina Faso, Kenya, and Uganda. Uh, And again, water is kind of a universal need and we're really seeing uh, communities come together to tackle it. And speaking about the uh, role of gender, a lot of times, uh, you know, men really appreciate it when they see women coming uh, up with these great solutions and they're encouraged by, you know, their increased ability to uh, produce food, uh, you know, and uh, some of our groups are distributing water tanks uh, to the women, uh, either at a subsidized rate or um, just free, uh, and it gives them an opportunity to become managers of this very valuable resource. Uh, it really quickly earns them a lot of respect in the community uh, and also proves that you know women are just as capable of kind of being in charge of these types of resources that you know it doesn't take a man to do that kind of job. Uh, and usually our groups like when the men become involved too. So it's it really should be a community effort. We look for groups that really are trying to include everybody into the equation, the young, the old, the men, women, uh, community leaders, whether it's religious or like government leaders, because when everyone's on the same page, they really can work together to solve these problems that, you know, if nobody can eat in their community, it's you're in kind of a dire situation and they don't want to wait for donors and the government to come save them. They want to they want to do it themselves. It's more fulfilling, gives them dignity uh, and, you know. It's in advancing their human rights. <laughs> exactly. And and even though you talk, um, Margaret, about, you know, everybody coming to get together, men and women and the young and the old, you know, to find some solutions for, you know, challenges in the agriculture sector. I mean, agriculture is in many parts of the world a gendered activity, correct? I mean, talk, yeah. talk, a, talk a little bit about that in the countries that, that you work in. Yeah. In Africa in particular, uh, women produce the food that they eat. Um, they do over 80% of all of the agriculture production on the continent. Um, and a lot of it's the hard labor, the actual planting, weeding, harvesting. Even when it's a cash crop, there's women involved, though often the men kind of control those types of resources. But when it comes to the food crops, it really is women that are given this responsibility and it's not appreciated it's kind of taken for granted and you know especially in face of climate change if they're not able to meet that challenge for their family you know it it really does impact women negatively because it's they're not fulfilling their part of the bargain yet no one really wants to step in and start helping them you know their husband's don't necessarily want to grow food crops or <laughs> be involved at that level. So. Right. So it's, it's like so many kinds of women's work, right, where it's completely critical to essentially um, maintaining and caring for the household, perhaps. But the income, the cash generation may be more in the hands of men. Yeah. So we see a lot of a lot of our groups are working Again, on women's rights issues, but some of it is very simply, you know, how do you talk to your husband and, uh, you know, make make more decisions in the household? Like what's going to give you the confidence to go to them and say, you know, I earned this from my the sale of my goods and I want to use it to to um, send you know, our daughter to school or, um, you know, I, I'd like to have more land to grow more or grow something different. So, you know, it takes it takes something like a group structure to sometimes give women that confidence that they can take that first step and then the next and then the next. And it spills over because eventually, you know, we see a lot of women leaders and they want to participate 
community level or run for government, you know, the sky's the limit once, you know, they kind of awaken to their own power. <laughs> this is Terry Verdi on 94.1 KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. I'm Michelle Chan, your host, and you've been listening to the voices of Gemma Bulos, the director of the Global Women's Water Initiative, and Margaret Youngs with the Global Fund for Women. Now, um, you know, this concept that we're talking about, how... Um, you know, you create leadership and grow political power for women through, for example, you know, getting them involved in supporting them on, you know, these kind of very practical solutions oriented, you know, activities um, is, is kind of an interesting change model that I'd love to dig into a little bit. Gemma, t- talk to us a little bit about how, you know, you've seen that sort of ramping up, uh, you know, on sort of the the leadership ladder, if you will. Sure. I I think what's exciting is that these women were leaders before we even got there. And um, part of our goal is to really be able to support them, to harness that leadership into areas that are going to have, you know, them be able to raise their voices in the really... uh, the really uh, sort of essential parts of society. I mean, one of the reasons why I love water is because water is an equalizer. You know, smallest plant and the richest man are equal in that we need it to survive. Everybody agrees. So what a place for us to actually start conversations and perhaps even collaborating. And I think what's exciting about having women be more involved as opposed to being the water bearers, but looking at them as being the water providers, this actually really helps them to sort of see that that they can actually transform whatever burdens they have into something that's a bigger opportunity for them. And I think as if you, one of the things to build that leadership is to be able to provide something that people are going to be excited about. And this is what the women are doing. They're being able to build, you know, simple technologies that are changing the lives of people. We have incredible stories of, you know, schools being able to eliminate typhoid because a woman, because these women have built tanks. We've, you know, seen uh, a woman who'd never had a, a background in water and sanitation and hygiene took our training, was uh, just randomly decided to apply for a board position in her local water board. Not only was she ele- elected to the board, she... Uh, uh, selected to the board, she was elected as the board chair, one of two women in a nine-person board. And part of w- one of our goals as the Global Women's Water Initiative is that because water, because women have the most profound interaction with water, they're the ones who clean and wash and cook and all of those things. You know, we have to really start institutionalizing institutionalizing water sanitation and hygiene because what ends up happening is that information gets shared and then it drops off generation after generation. One, you know, group of people you can do that with is women because they are the ones who are, again, the ones who are having that deeper interaction with it. Even on the simple level of at the household, household, if they're they, if they don't wash their hands before they cook, everyone's affected. So being able to support them to have the leadership in uh, bringing solutions to their communities, they not only, you know, are this, this becomes their voice. This, you know, because I think a lot of water organizations tend to um, try and have women at the decision making table just to meet a quota because women should be part of it. Um, you know, I, in fact, the uh, FAO says the exclusion of women from planning of water supply and sanitation schemes is a major cause of their high rate of failure. But oftentimes, water organizations invite them just to meet a quota. What we want to be able to do is not only have them invited because they're women, but because they have solutions and they have the answers. And that's uh, that's part of what we think is building leadership for women in the wash sector. Yeah. And tell tell us a little bit more about how um, a a woman's experience um, ends up being able to come up with or drive solutions that are different. You know, different than if it were kind of maybe done in a more mainstream or conventional male dominated institution, Gemma. Sure. Uh, Well, you know, here we are. uh, If you, you know, if you just look at a woman's day, uh, you know, for an, uh, an average African woman or something, they can spend upwards of eight hours a day walking to fetch water they're and they're carrying 45 44 uh, pounds of water on their heads their shoulders and their backs they're not walking on even roads so they've got you know they've got all of these uh these uh challenges with the um the terrain the terrain and then also because they don't have toilets or sanitation and have to open openly defecate they might get uh violently attacked so there's they have so much at stake 
You know, they're the ones who have most at stake. So why not invest in the ones who have most at stake? Because they're the ones who are going to have the most, um, you know, they're going to they're going to want to be the ones to come up with the sustainable solutions because they don't want to have to be able to have to do it over and over and over again. They want they want to be able to move forward. They want themselves to thrive. They want their families to thrive. They want their children to go to school. All of these are reasons for, you know, for building leaderships for, for women in the wash sector because it's just, you know, it just makes sense. It's not even a gender thing. It just makes sense. And they're the most practical people to seek to support this cause. Right. And Margaret, from your perspective as well and your experience, you know, how have you seen in the, all of these partner groups that you work with, have you seen how the solutions that that the women's and women's organizations bring forward um, may be different or may, you know, impact a different part of the problem that just wasn't necessarily seen before. Sure. Well, especially in agriculture, women already know so much. And so part of it is just kind of recognizing that power and encouraging them to share and to um, teach others, um, as well as, you know, bringing in new information and resources to them. But really what we see that makes a huge difference is that they don't just look at an agriculture project or water problem. You know, it's they see the realities of the whole woman. And so they're not going to just say, oh, well, you need to grow more food. So we're going to give you seeds. But, you know, they'll see, oh, this woman does not know how to read she does not know that there are laws in this country that say that she can inherit land. <laughs> uh, this woman doesn't know that maybe there's a scholarship fund that would be available to her if she applied at such and such uh, ministry. So a lot of it is kind of seeing these kind of interconnected things um, and addressing them all together. Uh, we had one group in Kenya that was really uh, notable. They're called Grassroots Organizations Operating Together in Sisterhood. They're in Kenya. Uh, they were working in a small village uh, in Kalifi, which is very drought prone. Um, and they were working with tw- 20 women farmers and they realized really early on that they were having a lot of trouble with the agricultural training. And it simply stemmed from this problem of illiteracy and they went and visited also the homes and they realized that not one of them had like a proper latrine and you know they saw immediately that you know this is this is a huge problem they so they brought in before they even got to the agricultural part you know they brought in the trainers to show them how to dig uh, sanitary pit, pit latrines um, you know help them understand why sanitation is important uh, you know, and then taught them how to write their names uh, and, you know, kind of found a young man in the community who became really passionate about, you know, furthering this woman's literacy. So, you know, it's not just like, oh, yeah, we're hungry, so we just need more food. It's more, you know, there's a whole host of things going on. So how can we holistically address the big the big picture. <laughs> that's that's fascinating, and and it reminds me actually of of a story um, that Gemma you had with respect to just mm-hmm. seeing kind of just the interlinkages between all these um, different kinds of issues that maybe traditionally or conventionally you would silo up. You know, um, there was a story that you told about this um, this project to build, I think, a water tank in a girl's high school in Uganda. Tell us about that. Sure. Uh, The team is uh, Orphans and Widows Association for Development and the uh, two women that we trained were Florence Aditi and Eunice Aliamo. And basically they approached a school to build a tank uh, at the school and they as a group decided that the best place to put it was um, in the girls' dorms. And this was a high school. And so in high school generally, you know, these are women who are uh, young girls who are starting menstruation and things like that. So before the tank was installed, uh, the nurse had reported that there were the women had to, the girls had to leave school for two or three hours to fetch water. Um, when they were menstruating, they would miss at least a week of school. I mean, here we, they are boarders, and you're thinking that it's not even guaranteed that they're going to actually go to school every 
day. So when they t- uh, when they actually uh, built the tank, some of the things that happened, uh, the girls uh, started to uh, be more alert in school because they are, they're actually fed because they're boarders. When they didn't have water, they couldn't cook the food or be late, so they were not focused in class. Up to five girls were actually fainting per day through from dehydration, so, you know. And so, um, and then they saved a ton of money, like thousands of dollars from uh, health costs from not having to send girls to, you know, uh, to the clinic because of water-related disease. And that money they actually were able to divert to a savings that, uh, that, that they are now actually building a borehole that the entire community can actually use. And the one uh, thing that, that I think people don't realize about having clean water, especially as it affects girls and women, is one of the things that the nurse had uh, reported had happened was that the girls started to ha- stopped having quote, inappropriate relationships, because what would happen is they were gone, they were waiting in line for three or four hours, they'd actually either get defiled or they'd have, you know, they'd have to, they would be forced to have, you know, inappropriate relations with with boys or men, and that was actually starting to reduce. Right, because they had to go about walking alone and exactly. things like that. Yeah, it's really fascinating how, you know, looking at, you know, Putting women in the center of these solutions, you know, ends up providing a more holistic sort of sense of what needs to be done rather than, you know, just one thing or another. It's um, fascinating. Um, Tell us then a little bit um, about how people can get more involved and to to learn a little bit more and connect, for example. I mean, here in the Bay Area, and we also have folks in Fresno, um, you know, how how people can learn more about some of these issues that may be happening around the world and at the same time, you know, get involved in ways that connect with maybe some of the issues that they're working with right here in, you know, their own backyards or, you know, or or in our own area. Um, Margaret, you can... Sure. Um, I encourage everyone to check out uh, the website, globalfundforwomen.org. Um, we actually, on the impact tab at the top kind of bar, um, there's a pull-down menu, and it's there's a African women feeding their families. I encourage you to check that out. That's our website for our webpage for my particular project. Uh, we have a nice little video on there, so you can actually get a sense of what it looks like, some of the women that we're working with. Um, and we hope to have new updates soon. We're working actually on the impact portion of our project as it comes to a close. Uh, so we'll have more to share on that. And I'm sure we will be having an event. So I encourage everyone also to sign up on our website uh, for our mailing list uh, to get updates. And uh, my email address is also on there. And I encourage anyone who's interested in learning more about Global Fund or about my particular initiative to give me an email. <laughs> so that is, again, um, globalfundforwomen.org. And uh, Margaret's um, contact is in there. And you can check it out for updates and, and whatnot. Gemma, give us a little bit of info and resources. Sure. Uh, you can go to globalwomenswater.org for the work that the Global Women's Water Initiative is doing. Uh, Women's Earth Alliance. Uh, dot org as well. That actually is uh, the home for Global Women's Water Initiative, and you can see other uh, initiatives around uh, agriculture and women in South Asia. Um, I think some other exciting sites just to get, uh, just to sort of get the statistics of, of the kind of crisis of you know that we that is affecting us globally around water is UN Water um, or the United Nations. UNICEF has a really good site um, on water, um, and they have all the updated statistics as well as uh, the water and sanitation program, uh, I think it's .org. So there's a lot of really, really great resources out there. And I think what you'll find is that water pretty much affects almost every sector. And if we, I think there's a, there's a, um, a Chinese proverb that says the wise, uh, the wise man solves the water, the, the problem of water first. Or the wise woman. The wise woman, exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Again, that was a typo. <laughs> <laughs> That's globalwomenswater.org, um, womensearthalliance.org, and unwater.org. Thank you so much, uh, Gemma and Margaret, for joining us, and to Erica Bridgman, our engineer. You can listen to archives of this show and others on kpfa.org, and we hope that you join us next week. For now, have a great weekend. <laughs> Hi, 
From the Amazon basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet.